This spotlight brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. Good evening and welcome to the spotlight. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Rose and tonight we're going to pay tribute to a hero killed in the line of duty. But if you've been watching the spotlight each week, you could almost see this coming. Repeat offenders are running wild. The violence and disregard for the law is rampant and the politics aren't protecting people like they're intended to. And innocent victims are being hurt and killed every week. It's the latest video to shock Seattle. A 62 year old nurse on her way to work at Harborview, assaulted by a homeless criminal with a violent, massive rap sheet. He attacked the woman on the escalator at the light rail station at South Jackson Street and Fifth Avenue, throwing her down the stairs twice, then stomping and kicking her, breaking the woman's collarbone and three of her ribs. Instead of starting her shift at Harborview, she was rushed there for surgery. The suspect, 40 year old Alexander J is no victim of circumstances or society. He's a predator. He has 22 convictions in Washington and California. They range from burglary and auto theft to domestic violence. Since 2015, he's had 15 bench warrants for skipping court. He's being held now on $150,000 bail. This is a man who has repeatedly shown a wanton disregard for society and order. Instead of being behind bars or in treatment where he belongs, Alexander J was on the prowl. He's not alone. On Tuesday, a SWAT team from the Pierce County Sheriff's Department tried to arrest this repeat offender. Jeremy Dayton had two strikes under his belt already, and if convicted of his latest assault charge, he was headed to prison for life. As deputies pulled into a mobile home park to arrest him, he jumped out of a vehicle and opened fire, killing Deputy Dom Collada and seriously injuring Sergeant Rich Scaniff. Dayton died in the shootout. He should have been behind bars. He was free on $250,000 bail and wanted for failing to appear in court stemming from an assault charge. In that case, he's accused of beating a 62-year-old man in an alleyway outside of a restaurant. That man was hurt so badly, doctors thought he might die from a brain bleed. Dayton's prior convictions include breaking his wife's jaw in 2017, along with beating and robbing another man back in 2000. Just hours after Tuesday's shootout, we spoke with his wife, Stacy, who had been in hiding. She and her daughter have been staying in a domestic violence shelter on the run from Dayton after she says he tried to kidnap their daughter last week. Stacy told us her thoughts are with the families of the deputies who were shot. I'm so devastated because they were doing everything they could to protect us, um, to ensure our safety because he had nothing to lose if he killed me. That's the honest truth. And if he kidnapped Maya, there's nothing he could have, you know, he had nothing to lose. So that's why we're in a domestic violence shelter. Um, we were on the run because um, he could kill me. He has like literally he told me the last conversation was, bitch, this is all your fault. I just moved back here from Reno. I left to Reno because I knew that he was out. He begged and begged, you know, I want to see my daughter. And I'm that kind of wife or kind of mother that I don't deprive my children of seeing their, their fathers. I don't believe in that because my mother did it to me. I think he had this in his a plan because uh, what kind of man wants to live behind the bars in prison for life when you know you're going to get life anyways, regardless of what's going to happen. So why not go out with a bank? I was told by his sister that he told her goodbye yesterday. He called me and Maya on Monday. Um, he told her, I love you, princess. I'm sorry. But then he asked to talk to me and all he did was yell at me and tell me it's all my fault, which everything that happened in the last couple years has been his fault, his mistakes. He used to be an amazing man. When I met him, um, he was making $13 an hour at Mankey. I got him into doing construction school for the union because I told him, you know, they have a program for felons and things like that. And then he ended up making almost $50 an hour. He was a husband. He was a good man, he was a provider, he helped me raise me and my kids. And then something happened. When he came home on uh, New Year's Eve, 2017, came home and busted my face. I have a scar right here. My teeth right here had to be fixed. Uh, I had to have reconstructive surgery. And he used to be such a good person, and I know it's because of drugs. And I thought that maybe he might change by going to prison. Uh, clearly that didn't happen. Maya's real dad is in um, Shelton right now, and he's in Aryan Nation. And they, when they get out of prison, they just throw them to the wolves. Our system is so messed up. 
and he should have got counseling. He should have had better, um, better help. But, and I've learned that from my dad. I've learned that from Maya's real father. I've learned that from Jeremy. And I've grown up around not, nothing but um, bikers and things like that. And it's just um, the criminal system is not good for anybody. I'm not trying to defend Jeremy at all because I'm very upset with what he. I can never forgive him for anything. But our system's f***ed up. And, um, I'm so sad that he shot the cop. I can only imagine what the wives are going through. Now my husband is a cop shooter, and I'm praying for those families to be okay and the cops to be okay. Cause it breaks my heart because all they were doing was trying to save people. I love my husband. I married my husband. I hate him so much for what he's done and what he's put me and my daughter through. So I'm more worried about the cops. I just want to make sure that they're okay and the wives are okay and their children are okay. I just can't believe he did this. So on the one hand, you have a public menace and on the other, Deputy Dom Calada, a dedicated public servant sworn to protecting us all from people like Jeremy Dayton. Collado spent five years in the Army. He was in the National Guard. And the team at KBTC Public Television in Tacoma produced a beautiful documentary about Deputy Collada in 2018 after he left the military and joined the Sheriff's Department. They were kind enough to let us share that with you now as a tribute to his life of service. Trailer for 9-6, I'll be in service working center. The Pierce County Sheriff's Department were responsible for unincorporated Pierce County, but with the transit police, um, I'm typically assigned to downtown Tacoma. Just patrolling along the bus routes and all the different transit centers around here. Being a cop in the area I grew up, I find it very rewarding because, especially with a newborn kid, it's pretty awesome to be able to be out there and be personally responsible with trying to keep the community safe and uh, keeping the streets safe because this is ultimately where my child's going to grow up and where I'm going to be keeping a family. My military service, I was active duty for seven years. Uh, I was in the Army. First four years I was an armor officer, and then my last three years I switched to military intelligence. And then um, I'm currently serving in the Washington National Guard. And I spent some time at Fort Hood, Texas before uh, coming back home over here to Joint Base Lewis McCord. For my transition from the military to a civilian career, as I was getting out, I mean, as a lot of officers do, you kind of look around and think I'm gonna work for these big businesses and become a manager somewhere. But as any young boy, you'd always wanted to become a police officer. And so I had a friend from college that uh, was a Pierce County Sheriff deputy. And I'd reach out to him for a few ride-alongs. And after after each ride along, that dream came a little bit more and more true, and I was like, I finally decided this is something that I might actually try to pursue. We started dating in 2008 when we went to Pacific Lutheran University, right before we graduated. My experience as a military wife uh, started when we got married in 2010. Transition from uh, military life to civilian life was pretty smooth, although there are challenges with any transition. Um, we, uh, we had done a lot of preparing for this. We knew that it was going to happen at some point. Um, it was just sort of a matter of time and logistics to see um, what the military was going to let us do. Um, were they going to station us in, um, in an area that we felt like we could transition out from easily? Um, and we were very lucky to, uh, to transition um, out of the military when we were at Fort Lewis. We were very lucky to get Fort Lewis as our, as our home post, which allowed us to, to, um, to move out of military life e more easily because we were at home. We were with our family. Um, we were in the area where a lot of our family and friends were, so um, that made it um, much more smooth. Some of the things I learned in the military that uh, transfer over well, there's some obvious stuff like being able to handle firearms or being able to like be in a tactical type of situation. But one of the things that kind of stand out to me uh, is like 
as a leader, like just being a, a leader of like of of, diff, of people and being a leader within the community and just being able to communicate with people and then uh, learning to influence people. That's something that I I didn't realize was going to stick out so much when I became a cop. But you come in and you talk to different people, whether it's a crisis or just interacting with them on the streets, and and that's the kind of stuff that we did while we were patrolling the streets in Iraq. I grew up in a Navy family, oh, so did I you? could make fun. <laughs> in the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, we have quite a few people who have served in the armed forces. Um, and usually when people talk about people who have graduated from the military and then come to law enforcement, they talk about job experience, maturity, and things like that. There's something that we miss if we just say that. What we miss is the fact that these people have a heart for service. These people have stepped forward before and said, hi, what I want to do has to be something about more than me. I recognize that it's not just all about me. I recognize that um, I owe some things. They have a sense of duty and obligation and sacrifice. That's exactly what we're looking for. That's the kind of core values that we're looking for. That's what we get when we have people in the Sheriff's Department who come from the United States military. My piece of advice for them is to be humble about their roots and then uh, aggressive with their goals. Everyone's gonna be respectful and, um, and appreciative of their service from the military, but um, I think the, some of the qualities that make them a good veteran and what they learned in the military uh, will help them aspire to, to, to succeed in the civilian life as long as they keep, keep pushing with the same drive and discipline that they had in the military. Coming up, repeat offenders, guns, and deadly consequences. How a pot shop robbery escalated in a hurry. Welcome back. Recently, we focused the spotlight on the escalating pot shop robberies after the first 40 heists, warning that somebody was gonna get killed. And that's exactly what happened this week. But it wasn't a store employee, it was a suspect. And it turns out two of the gunmen were repeat offenders. According to the tracking document shared with us by Ian Eisenberg, this is the 72nd pot shop robbery in Western Washington this year. The Brazen Bandits hit Green Theory in Factoria shortly after 11 a.m. on Wednesday. Here's how police say it went down. Mauricio Martinez Yanez and Anthony Barajas stormed into the store, guns drawn, while Rex Ekman, the third member of the crew, waited behind the wheel of the getaway car. Anthony Barajas is no stranger to the law. He was featured on Washington's Most Wanted in December of 2020 for a heist at a gun store in Kitsap County that netted the crooks 100 firearms. You can see on this video, Barajas is used to working in a crew, and he's no stranger to breaking the law. Barajas presses his pistol into the back of the young female clerk, forcing her upstairs into the office, turning this from an armed robbery into a kidnapping. Inside the office, he forces another worker to open the safe and leaves with a fat stack of cash. Take a look at Martinez Yanez. That's a real deal Israeli made Uzi in his hand, capable of shooting full auto. Well, during the robbery, somebody at the pot shop hit a panic alarm, tipping off Bellevue police who rushed to the scene. Officers were able to establish probable cause for the robbery and kidnapping. So they started pursuing the getaway car and got word to surrounding police departments. The suspects left Bellevue on the I-90 bridge heading west. Then they got on I-5 South to MLK Way, where they drove in and around Renton, where one of the suspects lives. By this point, Bellevue Police, the State Patrol, Seattle Police, and Renton Police were all in on the pursuit. The suspects left Renton and headed back to Seattle along Rainier Avenue. It was there between Cornell and Pilgrim Street that they blew out a tire and started driving on a rim, shooting out sparks. The trio turned off of Rainier onto Orcas Street in Columbia City. They ditched the car at 39th and Orcas. The suspects hoofed it. Turns out Ekman is slower than his friends. Cops caught him running a few blocks away near a house in the 3600 block of South Finley Street and arrested him. Police figured out the other two suspects were hiding in a shed behind a house on South Findlay. The home is owned by an 86-year-old woman. The spotlight's Matt Markovich spoke with her son during the madness. Just yeah. maybe just random that it happened to park in front of your mom's house? Oh yeah, it's random as hell. That woman was inside at the time. I'm worried, my mom of course, but surprised, nope. An SPD SWAT team arrived along with a canine unit from Kent. 
Seattle police took over with teams from the State Patrol, Bellevue and Renton standing by. Barajas and Martinez Yanez are holed up in the shed. Barajas with a pistol containing a 24 round extended magazine. Martinez Yanez with his Uzi. Two people. SPD released this body camera footage. Red coat, show me your hands. Both your hands. Showing the dramatic final moments of the standoff. They faced off with SWAT officers from SPD armed with M4s. Red coat is armed, took a shot at officers. He's down inside the shed, but still moving. In this body cam footage, you can see the restraint as an officer holds back, allowing Barajas to do the smart thing and surrender. Barajas drops to the ground as Martinez Yanez opens fire with the Uzi. SPD dropping him with a hail of gunfire. <laughs> Moments later, cell phone video from neighbors captured his body being carried out by SWAT team officers. The two suspects who survived were cuffed and taken to Bellevue for questioning. They appeared in court on Thursday. Eckford telling the judge he didn't know his friends were going to pull off a robbery. The judge didn't buy it, giving him $100,000 bail. Barajas is being held on half a million dollars bail. Now, new developments in one of the murders on 3rd Avenue in Seattle that we featured last time here on the Spotlight. Police arresting this man, 18-year-old Felix Gage Taylor. On Tuesday, Taylor and his mother walked into the Seattle Police West Precinct and announced that he wanted to confess. He's being held on half a million dollars bail and facing a murder rap for shooting and killing 15-year-old Michael Del Bianco near the corner of 3rd and Pine. From court documents, we're getting a clearer picture of what happened that night. According to detectives, surveillance video shows Del Bianco and Taylor arguing. Del Bianco then pulls a gun on Taylor and rips a blue bandana out of Taylor's hand. At that point, Del Bianco begins walking away while looking back and continuing to hold his gun. Taylor then draws his own weapon and fires a single deadly shot, striking Del Bianco in the abdomen. Del Bianco retreats across the street and collapses. A crowd gathers, and when police get there, Del Bianco no longer has his gun. A senseless killing that will likely end two young lives before they even started. Two men likely put in the position they were in by older gang members, too cowardly to man their own drug markets or settle their own beefs, but happy to partake in the profits. Meanwhile, police are still looking for tips as to who killed Reno Mayaba in the same section of downtown just three days prior. Despite that shooting happening on a crowded street in the middle of a Sunday afternoon, no one has come forward. None of these people you see scurrying away in surveillance video have had the decency to step up and share what they know. Hopefully that changes so Reno's family and his fiance, Dana, can have justice. Up next, Seattle takes the first step and admits it has a problem. Now it says there's a plan to go after the peskiest perps, ruining the Emerald City. Not all repeat offenders are violent. Seattle says it now has a list of the most prolific criminals, people who are lowering the quality of life for law-abiding citizens across the city. And now there's a new strategy to deal with them. The Spotlight's Matt Markovich has the story. Put down the stuff, put it down. Seattle police say Dylan Jackman is a habitual offender, moved to Seattle 15 months ago, and already has 18 different cases for shoplifting, threatening store employees referred by police to the city prosecutor. And that metric qualifies him to be on a new list. It's a list of 118 repeat offenders who over the last five years are accused of committing roughly 2,400 crimes, including 1,100 thefts, nearly 600 trespass complaints, 400 assaults and 100 weapons violations. It shouldn't have gotten this bad uh, for this long for that many individuals. It has been. Uh, we can't allow it to continue for them or for the public. So now they'll be getting special treatment by Seattle police, city and county prosecutors, the jail and the courts. Will you be asking to keep these people in jail longer just so they're off the street? If need be, that will be the case. Because of COVID, the King County Jail has not been booking people behind bars accused of nonviolent offenses like shoplifting. Yeah, officers would, would end up making an arrest, take them back to the precinct, and then they would be released uh, without uh, going to jail. So where does the jail play a role in all this? I mean, if they're not accepting bookings, will they accept bookings now? Well, that's part of the agreement. The jail has agreed that any of the 118 offenders can be booked into jail for nonviolent offenses. The cases will be pushed to the head of the line, some consolidated and packaged for longer jail times or requirements to seek treatment as an alternative. 
but it's only people who meet a certain criteria. John Lomax, the guy accused of stealing 22 times from the Seattle downtown Target, including a 70-inch TV. He's not on the list. He just hasn't been accused of stealing often enough. Finally tonight, our thoughts are with the members of the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, people who were touched by and loved Deputy Dom Collada. During COVID, the Sheriff's Department had deputies read children's books to kids that they could share on social media. So here's Dom reading his son's favorite book. Under the moon, huddle together, penguins seek warmth in the icy weather. So when you close your eyes at night, imagine the moon's twinkling light shining down with a silvery glow as we dream our dreams in the world below. And that's the end. The coming weeks will be especially hard for the men and women of the Pierce County Sheriff's Department as funeral arrangements are made. A legacy fund has been established in memory of Deputy Dom Collada. 100% of the funds will go directly to Deputy Collada's wife and his four-year-old son. And you can donate through this QR code or find the link on fox13seattle.com. That's all the time we have on this edition of the Spotlight. Until next week, be smart and stay safe.